The topic today is climate action planning and the two remaining webinars in this series, Friday, this Friday the 7th and the following Friday, will cover circular economy and plastics and also food systems and tourism. And we'll post the invitations to those in, um, in the chat, the links to those for you to register. The Transforming Tourism Value Change Project is led by the United Nations Environment Program and funded by the German government's International Climate Change Initiative. And the Travel Foundation is an implementing partner for this project, and we're pleased to be hosting this webinar today. For those of you not familiar with the Transforming Tourism Value Chains project, it aims at reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving resource efficiency in key tourism sector value chains with high resource use in four countries, the Philippines, St. Lucia, Mauritius, and Dominican Republic. Tourism and hospitality are responsible for approximately 8% of global emissions and the impacts of climate change are increasingly being seen at destination level. And this affects not only communities and the natural environment, but also the quality of the tourism product itself, reducing the attractiveness of destinations and negatively impacting consumer confidence. Learning from each other and working collaboratively is vital to addressing these issues. In this one hour webinar, we'll provide practical guidance on climate action planning and implementation for accommodation providers, as well as we'll be hearing from some fantastic businesses already taking action to provide insight and inspiration to you. We have for you five fantastic speakers today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing their presentations, and we'll follow that up with a Q&A. So please share your own stories and insights on the chat anytime, and put your questions for the speakers in the Q&A box below. This webinar is being recorded and the video will be available afterwards. And now to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Rebecca Armstrong, a sustainable tourism specialist at the Travel Foundation. Our second speaker is Al Judge, managing director of Alley Cats Mountain Holidays in France. Our third speaker is Thierry Montocchio, the CEO of Rogers Hospitality in Mauritius. Our fourth speaker is Ali Sharif, Community Outreach Coordinator for the Maldives Underwater Initiative at Six Senses Lamu. And our fifth speaker is Arnfin Oynes, Social and Environmental Conscience for Soneva. So now I'd like to invite Rebecca to share her screen and start our first presentation, which will really set the scene for this topic. Thank you, Kelly, and hello, everybody. So firstly, why create a climate action plan for your business? Just moving on to the next slide. Thank you. So there are many reasons really why it makes good sense to have a climate action plan as a, as a, as a tourism and accommodation business. Um, it's an important element in risk management and future planning. And of course, it can contribute to cost reductions through operational efficiency as well. It also positions you to respond to increasing expectations for action from operators, from investors, as well as, of course, customers. It'll help you break down what you need to do um, into manageable actions and place you in a good position to collaborate with others as well to maximise impact. So UNEP, UNWTO and the Travel Foundation were some of the founding partners of the Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action and Tourism, which we launched at... 20, in 2021 at COP26. Every signatory to the Glasgow Declaration um, commits to work together to meet some key global commitments to halve emissions by 2030 and to reach net zero as soon as possible before 2050, um, as well as individually committing to publish climate action plans within 12 months of, of signing and implementing them, and then also to report annually um, on their progress. The declaration now has around 700 signatories um, on the next slide from all around the world. Um, you'll probably recognize at least some logos from your own region um, on this small selection here. But as I say, there's nearly um, 700 signatories right now. The declaration um, provides five pathways which you can use as a framework for climate action planning. They are measure, decarbonize, regenerate, collaborate and finance. 
And I, I find it helpful to think about the first three as really setting out what we need to do. It's important, I think, to note that these are pathways and not steps. So, for example, you don't have to completely um, crack measurement before you move on to decarbonize. They work together um, to build up your, your action um, over time. But those first three really set out what it's important to do. And then the um, fourth and fifth pathways really provide ways to do it um, by working together to maximize our impact and ensuring the finance and resources are in place to deliver climate action. So I'm just going to go briefly through um, the, the five pathways and how these might frame um, your own climate action planning. Um, so the first pathway is to measure um, your business's emissions. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, and the, the GHG protocol categorizes emissions into three scopes. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, so scope one is the direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. So just moving on to the next. Um, little section. So um, emissions from owned or controlled sources. For, so for accommodation providers, these are likely to be, for example, on-site gas and fuel consumption um, and on-site vehicles. And then scope two um, are the indirect emissions from the generation of purchased um, energy electricity. So used, for example, for in-house laundry, um, lighting, heating, cooling, air conditioning, etc., kitchen appliances and so on. And then scope three are all the other indirect emissions in the value chain. So these are both upstream and downstream. So, for example, um, this would include external laundry services, um, waste generation and waste disposal, um, food and beverage supply supply and production, um, travel by your staff, by um, guests, by for, for business and commuting, um, and other pu purchase goods and services and, and leased assets. So how do we measure each of these three scopes? And if you're just starting out, I would really suggest that you start with scope one and two, because those are um, much, much easier to make a start on. And then, and then, as I say, build up that action as you as you go along. So um, in terms of scope one and two, um, you, you should be able to measure these fairly easily from your bills. So for example, um, for your from your fuel that you purchase and um, for your scope one emissions um, and from um, electricity and other utility bills um, if you're on the grid, for example, for scope two. So you'll be able to use the consumption figures um, from those bills um, to, to establish a baseline effectively um, and work out what your current, current consumption is. Um, scope three emissions um, often actually form the biggest part of a business's emissions, but they're often the most difficult to measure um, because they are outside your, your direct control. But there are ways in which you can um, look at measuring scope three, as I say, maybe a bit further down the line once you've um, created a system for scope one and, and two. So for scope three, um, you can work with your suppliers and measure, for example, um, the weight of food that you're purchasing and perhaps the, the weight of food. That's, that's currently wasted. Um, you could uh, measure, for example, the proportion of, of goods and services that you source locally. Um, you could also look at the, your guest uptake of different offers. So how many of your guests, for example, travel to you um, by, by um, sustainable transport or um, opt for plant-based options in your menu, um, or for example, say that they'll implement a solution that they've seen you implement in your business when they go back home. So there are creative ways that you can also um, measure your scope or begin to look at your scope three um, emissions. So there are many measurement tools available. Um, we will put a link in, in the chat to the UNEP um, GHG tool for SME um, accommodation providers than the MICE sector. Um, there's also um, a, some resources um, are available on the SME Climate Hub, um, which will just come up in a second on the next slide. Um, so just moving on to, to that link. So this is also a good source of, um, of resources and tools. We will put the, the various links in the chat. Okay, so moving on to the next pathway of decarbonize, and this can involve a real spectrum of actions. Um, and this is really the sort of hub of your, your climate action plan, if you like. This is this is where you can list out um, the different activities that you might start to implement um, in perhaps the first year or two of your, of your climate action plan. Um, so this could involve changes in practice and efficiency measures. So this might be things like switch off policies, using natural lighting instead of artificial lighting, setting thermostat controls and water temperatures and laundry temperatures um, at, at lower but, but safe temperatures, but reducing the those temperatures um, as much as possible um, and circular waste management practices. Product or service changes might include things like eliminating single use plastics from your business, um, introducing a plant based menu um, and local procurement. 
new equipment and technology might encompass a, a big range of, of choices from fairly low cost um, changes to larger costs, perhaps when you replace old or inefficient equipment with new, more energy efficient um, options. Um, but you could also think about things like lighting and motion sensors, um, whole energy management systems. There's a whole spectrum, um, renewable energy, biogas generation, heat pumps, etc., electric vehicles. So that's really about changing um, the technology and equipment um, that you use to make it more efficient. And that is really where you can make some big um, energy savings and then behavior change as well so involving your staff giving them training and support um, offering them real-time data so that they can see the the changes uh, the impact that the, the changes they're making um, are having so just moving on to the next slide another um useful thing that we found is is thinking about your operations as if you're looking through a climate lens so imagine you're using in that climate lens um, and how some of your operations might look different if you thought about the climate impacts um, of those elements of your business. So for example, how might your guest experience or communications look different if you thought about climate impacts? Um, would you change your food and beverage offering um, if you were thinking about the, the emissions factor of, of, of that menu? Um, and how about transport and the information you give your guests on how to reach you? Could you think about that um, through that climate lens? And then to make your plan manageable, um, it's also important to prioritise your actions to help you best focus your resources, just to make sure that you really can deliver um, year on year. So perhaps thinking just about that, that first year or two um, of your climate action, what will you prioritise? And it's useful to think about impact. So for example, what are the areas of your operation that use most energy that perhaps you could focus on first? Um, urgency, how pressing is the issue to address now? What difference will it make if we, if we address that quickly? Um, and then capacity, so what resources and finance do you have in place to be able to deliver those actions? So if you have a whole list of ideas perhaps that you've generated around decarbonisation, this is a useful process to go through to help you prioritise what to focus on first. So then moving on to the third pathway, regenerate. So as part of your climate action plan, you may choose to invest in nature-based solutions um, in your own community or country, um, such as conservation and carbon capture projects. Um, and some questions to ask your business um, might be, for example, how can you support the protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems? Um, are there any opportunities to partner with local regeneration projects? Could you offer your staff opportunities to participate that? And how can you engage visitors and guests in biodiversity restoration and protection? Um, are there ways for them to get involved um, and to form that connection to the environment that they're visiting and really um, learn how to care for it? Um, carbon offsetting also obviously comes in here, um, but we would um, emphasize really that that's a, that's a sort of final option um, in, in the list of options. Um, moving on then to the, um, the how to, so the two pathways at the end being the how to deliver. So the first of those being um, collaborate. And I think one of the best things about climate action is that it presents this real opportunity um, to collaborate rather than compete. We're all facing uh, the same big challenge and together we really can maximize the impact that we make. Um, so as accommodation providers, I'd encourage you to actively seek out others in your destination through your professional associations perhaps, um, we'll share ideas really and identify um, concrete initiatives that you can work on um, together, as I say, to maximize that, that collective impact. And then the final pathway um, is to make sure that finance um, and indeed resources generally um, are in place to ensure that your climate action plan um, can be implemented. Um, this can be internal, so for example by using guest revenue um, to fund action as well as um, internal investment of, of resources, um, or it might be external through accessing funding and financing opportunities, um, including again working um, collectively and collaboratively with, with others on those opportunities. Um, so together, the five pathways really provide um, a useful framework, um, which is on the next slide, um, for preparing your, your climate action plan. Um, we've just set out some, some key questions around those, those pathways there. Um, these will be in the materials um, shared afterwards, but just using those, um, those five pathways to work out what you can measure, decarbonize, 
contribute to regeneration? Who should you collaborate with and how will you finance um, those actions? So it's a very quick overview really of that framework. Um, I'll just leave you, um, I wanted to finish by highlighting um, some of the, the other tools and resources available um, on the One Planet Network site, which is just on the final slide. Um, and we'll put the link um, in the chat to that resource um, as well. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that excellent overview and introduction to the pathways with some real practical guidance there. We'll now go to Al Judge, who can give us some of his own experience of measuring and decarbonizing in his business. Over to you, Al. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Al. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Alley Cats. Uh, we provide um, luxury catered chalet holidays and self-catered chalet holidays. And we're based in the ski resort of Morzine in France. Um, I run the business with uh, my wife, who is also my business partner, Kat. And uh, we have three children who are five, eight and ten. Um, we've been running Alley Cats since 2011. Um, and over that time, our journey of how we to provide sustainable holidays has changed hugely. And what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about where we've got to on that journey, especially in the last couple of years, where we've really started to accelerate what we're doing. <clears throat> um, so we can go on to the, to the next slide, please. So I just thought I'd start with this quote, which always kind of makes me smile. Plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. And we've we certainly found that. So originally we uh, planned a four stage process to measure, to reduce, uh, to remove the carbon that we had created uh, and then communicate. And then what we actually did was because we, you know, we effectively in the first few months of doing this, we learned more than we thought there was to know. Um, and it's, it's important that, you know, plans are flexible, our, our plans were flexible. Um, so, for example, um, we didn't even know that waste offsetting was a thing, um, and it's now something that we've, you know, really taken very seriously. And we ended up doing with our, all of our team measuring their waste, um, which coming from K to Chalets is, you know, not not um, insignificant. Um, weighing the waste, calculating how much we created over the course of the season, and then offsetting it um, through a partner new cycle. Um, but that was a, that was an initiative that we didn't even know was was um, doable at the outset. Um, and in the process of of uh, realizing that goal of offsetting waste, we actually realized we could become a zero food waste business, which for a catered you know a catering business is a, is a big deal. And we now have systems with um, animals, uh, mainly chickens, and also um, a bakashi composting uh, system that allows us to to essentially reuse all of our food waste um, into the garden for and the growing area for 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 reproducing vegetables in a perma with a permaculture technique um, one of the other things that we started to do is reshape our portfolio so um, chalets alpine chalets are traditionally have been heated with um, using um, oil uh, and sometimes gas um, and what we found we've been able to do over the last three to five years is reshape the portfolio. So the, the chalets that are heated with oil, we've managed to remove from our portfolio and introduce new chalets that are primarily heated with air source heat pumps. And that's massively reduced the, our carbon emissions over the course of the last couple of years. <clears throat> Finally, the other thing that we came to learn was that being carbon neutral as a business was not actually even a particularly meaningful goal. Um, what we came to learn was that we are contributing to carbon neutrality. Us being carbon neutral in and of itself doesn't achieve the overall global goal of carbon neutrality. And the language we use is important. Um, so we now talk about being contributing to carbon neutrality and one of the key things we're going to be working on over the course of the next couple of years is working with our competitors our suppliers our partners and our customers um, in any way that we can to help affect even more meaningful change um, if we can go on to the next slide please 
So the measuring part of the of the process um, is, uh, it, you know, slightly slightly boring, but it's you know is is important. So first of all, calculating usage and consumption. So access to data is key here. Um, so in our case, it was about um, being able to access energy bills um, and go through. Uh, initially was to go through all of our receipts to find out how much fuel we'd use in all our vehicles and our chalets and the amount of gas bottles we'd use for cooking etc um, and it was it was laborious and time consuming but what we came to learn was that uh, we now have incorporated that environmental accounting process for want of a better phrase into our overall financial accounting process. So instead of an end of year, big piece of work to try and go and find all these bits of data, we just have our finance team measure um, the environmental impact at the same time as they measure the impact onto our balance sheet. Uh, I think it's important here as well to, to say that um, it's important not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, getting to the Nth, uh, nth level of detail in every um, piece of data is counterproductive. I think working out accurately, um, you know, with a good estimate is more often than good not good enough. And especially if you're a small business owner, your your investment, your act estimate is likely to be very good. Um, then once you've gone when you, when once you've done the the calculation um, and you've worked worked out your usage and consumption. Calculating the emissions is the next bit. Now, this bit we found to be quite an esoteric process. It involves working out the carbon coefficient for each type of emission. And I think getting help on this point is worth doing um, if you're wanting to know exactly how many kilograms or tons of carbon you're emitting for each type of usage. Um, working through national websites to understand the coefficient for each type of data is quite, quite, can be quite hard. Uh, so I would recommend um, getting help um, on this point if you can. Um, and then finally, just say, I think it's important to be transparent, uh, methodical, making your approach and your um, known to people, let people pick holes in it. Um, and we've we certainly had people who read what we were doing and come back to us with advice on um, the language we're using, on the approach we're taking, and they all helped us you know, do better for next year. Okay, on to the next slide, please. And then finally, so if, if you have a limited budget within your business to, to, uh, to reduce your emissions, then I would say spend as much money as you can on decarbonizing it um, rather than measuring it. Because you're likely to know if you're, you know, you're likely to know which your key emission areas areas are anyway. So spend the money on decarbonizing. It's 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 a more effective um, way of having a, a meaningful environmental impact. And I think there are kind of uh, there are three stages um, that we went through. The first um, many years ago was when we thought that we can make periphery changes um, that save emissions, but it's kind of based on the customer getting less. Um, a good example is hotels. Um, asking their um their customers to um hang up their towels and use you know use less uh towels and, and washing and energy in the process um it's based on the customer getting less and the you know the business saving money and energy then i think if you're wanting to take on real uh meaningful decarbonization you have to make these changes that save emissions but do require an investment from your business so whether that's in the case of producing food, it's buying um, organic, local, um, it's, it's going to be more expensive. Um, it's, going to, it's going to cost you on the bottom line. Um, and I think that uh, the, the environmental cost uh, of, what, of, you know, of running a business hasn't yet been factored into the price by governments. And that's something that we, we felt we were obliged to do ourselves so so pricing in that cost ourselves by buying better quality or by buying or by choosing suppliers who had um it made the the necessary environmental changes to their business was something that we had to be willing to do in order to make have a meaningful impact and by making that investment it allows you to go on to the third phrase which is 
when you start to see a return on that investment, when your customers choose your business because of what you believe, um, there's a good quote, quote from Simon Sinek, um, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. If you talk about the process that you're going through, why you're doing it, the change you're making, you will attract um, loyal customers. And that will, that will be the point at which that investment in phase two gets, gets paid off. Um, and that's it for me. Over to you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Al, for those examples of your creative and effective solutions and things like your zero waste and shifting to electric heat sources and working with the finance team to calculate carbon <laughs> emissions and reminding us that customers choose you because of what you believe and the good that you do uh, and not just what you offer. Uh, now we'll move on to Thierry Montocchio of Rogers Hospitality, highlighting some decarbonization measures they are taking. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, good afternoon to everyone from Mauritius. So I'm uh, Thierry. I'm the CEO of uh, Rogers Hospitality. We operate hotels and uh, leisure and uh, restoration in Mauritius. We have two uh, hotel brands, Heritage, which is our five-star brand, and which are in a domain in Mauritius, in the south of Mauritius, in Belon, and five uh, veranda hotels uh, around the island. So for Mauritius, the social and economic benefits of travel and tourism is undeniable. It accounts for 24% of our GDP. And as the tourism industry is forecasted to continue to grow following the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, its share of CO2 may further increase, especially as other sectors decarbonize in the coming years. As a business, uh, we therefore recognize that decisive climate action from tourism, including of aviation, is crucial to delivering benefits to society in an environmentally sustainable way. Um, alone, at our level, we cannot have an impact on the planet but we can have an impact on our local uh, ecosystem. So our sustainability program called Now for Tomorrow is not just about telling people that it is time to act now for the environment and for future generations, but it's, it's about leading by example for us here. So since uh, 15 years, we've been working on various uh, initiatives to reduce our carbon emissions alongside other projects for a more sustainable and inclusive growth. And it became apparent last year that we needed to share our initiatives and progress with our guests, hence the initiative of regrouping all our actions and a comprehensive sustainability program now for tomorrow, and which comprises five areas of action, namely energy transi transition, circular economy, protection of biodiversity, living and integrated communities and uh, inclusive development. Uh, as we all know, long haul destination outer islands like ours are heavily reliant on tourism and we are dependent on airlines for accessibility. Therefore, we are striving at attracting tourists who care about sustainability and ensure that we are doing all it, it takes to protect our destination and reduce our carbon emissions. So uh, what are we doing to decarbonize, to reduce our carbon emissions? And how did we decide where to start? We carried out internal assessments to identify our focus areas to reduce our carbon footprint. We've conducted energy efficiency audits and used recommendations to identify the significant impacts of our business operations to carefully choose the right initiatives to limit our carbon emissions to a minimum. Our supply chain plays a vital role in our decarbonization program. Our procurement team is committed and engaged in embarking more responsible supply chain partners in this effort of reducing carbon emissions. And in the last year, the following initiatives have been carried out within our resorts to help reducing carbon emissions. So first, as of July 22, 
and I'm happy to say 95% of fish, seafood, fruits, vegetables, meat, and poultry from our tourism establishments are sourced from local farmers, producers, growers, suppliers, and supported by regional partners. Menus have been reviewed by chefs to substitute produce, products, sorry, which come from abroad with locally available option, options. We, we, do, we, we did a lot of work to encourage our chefs to find out new menus and to, to put ahead our own local terroir, if I may say, and that has really paid off. And following our surveys, we are at 62% currently of sourcing exclusively from the local market, the rest being in the Indian Ocean region. Region. So that significantly reduces our carbon footprint from imports. Then we commit to reduce our numbers of wastes landfilled. A waste management program has been implemented in all our resorts to better sort, reduce, recycle, and reuse materials generated as waste by operations, contributing to a lower greenhouse emission. Then a project and process on eliminating single-use plastic items was initiated since last year, whereby guest-facing single-use plastic items were tackled as a priority. We have identified 25 guest-facing plastic products, of which we have succeeded in finding 15 environmentally friendly alternatives, representing 60% of the objective as of June 22. We've also engaged our staff on decarbonization. 70% of our workforce followed awareness sessions on various energy reduction possibilities and behavioral changes have been observed to significantly reduce associated emissions. Then we have recently received approval from the local authorities to develop a photovoltaic farm of four megawatts at Bellum for our heritage hotels representing around 80% of our two hotels' electricity consumption. Our partners responsible for the installation of a photovoltaic farm have set an objective of project completion by the end of next year. Taking into consideration the successful implementation of this solar farm in Belhomme, this would en enable us to reduce our carbon emission by 46%, so that would be huge. Uh, last year, for example, we had 10 cleaning campaigns that were done across the villages where our hotels are situated, and we collected more than two tons of waste. Uh, when we do that, we also aim at creating awareness on pollution during those community initiatives. And we have, of course, our own water bottling plant within all our hotel operations to avoid use of plastic bottles, which have a higher carbon footprint. And since the, the reopening of our borders last year, since October last year on our heritage resorts, we are offering carbon neutral stays to our guests. How did we go about it? Uh, we evaluated our carbon footprint in the first place and implemented reduction initiatives as a, associated with our emissions. And we work with ERA an environmental commodity trader on our carbon offset program through local projects. And for example, for the year 1819, our two hotels, we estimate, emitted 90 kilo of CO2 equivalent per guest night. And um, on this effort now, we have been able to reduce it by 10% for the last year to 82 uh, kilos. So accompanied by ERA, we are off offsetting via two solar photovoltaic farms in Mauritius, Voltus Green and Helios uh, at Beauchamp. And um, currently, uh, services of energy auditors are being sought to conduct energy audits across our hotels and resorts in the view of identifying more energy intensive operations and proposing solutions to reduce the energy uh, consumption. So with that doubt, uh, we're doing our utmost to contribute to the carbon emission reduction, as well as encouraging our stakeholders and community to reduce their overall emissions through sim simple daily gestures and new ways of operating. 
which can also bring new opportunities for business and attract guests who care about protecting our natural environment. So for, for the time being, uh, these initiatives of offering carbon neutral stays is at our own cost. And obviously, obviously it's an incentive to reduce the footprint on the one hand, but we are also looking into ways onto how to make our guests also to contribute uh, to that effort because it's, uh, it's complicated in the long term. And we're now doing that on two of our hotels. Uh, when we try to to apply it on on all of our hotels, but I think we've been the first in uh, in Mauritius to offer a carbon neutral stays, and still are the first because it has some cost. But we we decided to put our foot on the ground because it's it's the only way to to try to be significant, uh, if I may say. So um, that, that's it uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry, for telling us about the Now for Tomorrow impressive program um, that spans actions to protect the destination across biodiversity, community well-being, local food systems, investment in renewable energy and reduction of plastics and staff training all leading to decarbonization of your properties. Thank you again. And we'll move over to Ali um, Sharif to speak to us about um, Six Senses LAMU and the collaboration initiative of the Maldives program that you have. Go ahead. Hi, good evening uh, from the Maldives. Um, yeah, my name is Ali. I work as a community outreach coordinator for Maldives Underwater Initiative team, uh, also known as MOI by Six Senses LAMU. Uh, I tell you next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, yeah, MUI is an initiative set up by Six Senses Lamu in collaboration with three international NGOs. Uh, we got Blue Man Foundation, Oliver Ridley Project, and Manta Trust, uh, who are partners. Uh, our mission is to lead the tourism industry in the Maldives through meaningful medical conservation efforts based on research, education, and community outreach. These are three main pillars of, um, MUI. Um, and we hope to do that by inspiring and empowering a local and global community of Medin stewards that will create a culture of positive action for our ocean in Lama and beyond. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, and we are based in the beautiful island of Oro Valley, the Six Senses Lama, a sustainable focus resort in the southern uh, Lama top in the Maldives. Uh, Six Senses has been practicing responsible and sustainable tourism uh, for the past decade now. Um, and the Maldives Underwater Initiative team, or MUI team, has over 10 marine biologists, environmentalists, and educators, uh, each with very specific focus area in marine conservation. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, we have several projects, and I think our approach is more or less the same uh, as the previous speakers. Uh, and for regenerate for regeneration and collaboration, our product model seagrass project uh, is a is a good good example. Um, uh, next slide. So before we talk about the projects, I think it's worth noting what seagrass is. Uh, seagrass is a flowering plant that grows uh, fully submerged in the water. Uh, usually occurs in clear, sheltered, uh, and shallow waters. And we have uh, seagrass growing around our islands in the Maldives. Um, and seagrass is found, in, is found in all continents except Antarctica, because it's too cold there. Uh, and there's about 80 different kinds of uh, different species of uh, seagrass found worldwide. And we managed to identify about eight different species in the Maldives. Uh, and there is enough evidence out there that seagrass is a crucial coastal ecosystem um, because it's a nursery ground for a lot of uh, juvenile reef fish. Uh, it protects shorelines, promotes uh, healthy coral reefs, uh, and it's a primary food source for a lot of fish, including uh, endangered species like the green sea turtle, the largest uh, hard shell turtles in the world. Uh, but the superpower of seagrass is, I think, its ability to sequester carbon, uh, bury them uh, in the ground. Um, and if you had to talk about climate change and that being a uh, climate crisis, I think we need ecosystems uh, such as seagrass to be healthy and intact, to do what it does best, uh, that is to fight climate change. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so our journey with seagrass has been long. Uh, so we have been monitoring of seagrass since 2012. Um, but things started to pick up in 2017, uh, in July. Uh, we took a stand to protect seagrass around the island and start conducting research and guest education about seagrass. Um, contrary to what most believe, the guests actually enjoy snorkeling around the seagrass meadows, uh, seeing turtles and other megafauna with all different kinds of fish and other lives add values to the guest stay and experience. Um, in August 2018, the team did a uh, perception survey at other resorts um, looking into uh, seagrass management in other resort establishments in the Maldives, and we found out that 50% of the resorts in the Maldives actually remove seagrass, uh, mainly for aesthetic reasons. Uh, the seagrass are seen as a nuisance uh, and unnatural to the Maldives. Um, and after us having learned like the ecosystem services that seagrass provide, uh, we wanted to do something about it. And in 2019, we collaborated with Blue Meadow Foundation to launch uh, Product Mode Seagrass campaign. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, the objective of this campaign, the social media campaign, was to raise awareness and the importance and importance and value of seagrass in the Maldives. Um, uh, these are some of the assets that were created and shared around. We could go to the next slide, Teddy. Cool. Um, and it was a quite successful uh, campaign uh, by May 2019. Um, all this uh, Ministry of Tourism had officially endorsed the campaign. By the end of it, we had about 27% of the resorts in the Maldives uh, pledged to protect uh, at least 80% of the seagrass uh, around the islands. Uh, through the campaign, uh, we did. Uh, 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 we and our partner resorts in the Maldives co collectively protected about 900,000 square meters of seagrass in the country, uh, which is a great, uh, great win for us. Uh, from there, we went on to develop the first ever Maldives seagrass monitoring network and protocol. This was done in collaboration uh, with seagrass experts from Australia, Dr. Mike Rashid from JCU uh, and Mike Van Coolen from Murdoch University, uh, again in collaboration with Blue Meadow Foundation and Maldives Resident Reefs. Uh, and in May 2020, uh, Maldives Minister of Fisheries uh, and Agriculture actually adopted the seagrass monitoring protocol uh, as a standardized monitoring method uh, for the whole of the country, which was again a major win for us. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so since then, that we have been conducting annual monitoring of seagrass around our island. Uh, and currently, uh, we are looking uh, in the, we also collected the carbon cores of seagrass meadows. The idea was to look into the carbon storing capacity of the Maldives and using that data to develop and formulate a carbon cadence project. Um, this again was done in collaboration with Blue, ben, uh, Blue Carbon Lab in Australia with uh, Dr. Peter McCready. Uh, and our idea is that to use this uh, carbon carrying project, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, yeah. through this carbon carrying project, we hope to support the communities uh, from the uh to roll out climate change adaptation projects. Uh, the aim of is to make communities more resilient in the face of climate change, and also for us to be more energy efficient uh, as well as, uh, you know, build a uh, better world for everyone and reach SDG goals. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So yeah, that's actually then the, the slides. If you have any question, uh, it was just five minute presentation, so couldn't go into the detail, but if you're interested to reach out and learn more about what we do, you could reach out to uh, the context, uh, the email addresses on the slide here. Thank you, I'll, uh, yeah. Thank you, Ali, so much for telling us about your regenerative program and the superpowers of seagrass to protect marine destinations. We will go to our fifth and final speaker, Arnfin Oynes from Soneva, and he will tell us um, about how they are financing climate action.
Go ahead, Arnfin. Thank you, Kelly. Developing sustainably has for many the perception that is expensive. That thinking is a bit like an ostrich sticking its head in the ground not to face the facts. Climate action, inaction is far more expensive. Economic benefits of climate action will outweigh the costs. So how do you finance climate action? Allow me to give three examples of ways to finance climate action and fund regeneration. Next slide, please. Renewable energy is important to lower emissions. In 2016, we installed 700 kilowatt solar PV plant at Sunevafushi in the Maldives using a power purchase agreement. Here, uh, the solar company financed the panels in exchange for us buying clean electricity that they provide. That saved us from the upfront investments and the electricity rate we are paying is significantly lower than producing it ourselves using diesel generators. Now we are looking at expanding this fourfold, including batteries, and this time we have secured financing for it. With lowered cost of technology and an increasing oil prices, the investment is hugely financial beneficial. As you can see, we use two ways to finance our solar, initially through our power purchase agreement, and now we're moving towards a loan funding. So one can do it either way. Next slide, please. We view waste as a resource rather than something you throw away. We call it waste to wealth. 90% of our waste is recycled, which we have achieved through investing in people and equipment. For example, at Suneva Fushi, we have set up a glass studio that turns glass waste into art and functional pieces that are sold. Our waste to wealth team has over the years generated $3 million in value. That is what we call waste to wealth. Next slide, please. At Suneva, we add a 2% environmental fee to our guests' room bill, with all the proceeds going to the Suneva Foundation that invests in carbon mitigating projects. We find that our guests are more than happy to accept the small charge, uh, and we have so far raised about $11 million from a few results. This practice has enabled Suneva to be carbon neutral, including indirect emissions, such as guest air travel. At the same time, the Suneva Foundation has been able to sell excess carbon credits from projects like the Myanmar Stoves campaign. Funds generated from carbon sales is reinvested into the project as well as new projects. Next slide, please. Example of new projects is the forest restoration in Mozambique, where uh, the commitment is to plant 3.7 million trees, restoring 3,300 3, hectares over a period of four years. And we started at the beginning of this year and have roughly planted a million trees so far. Next slide, please. Another example is our coral propagation project in the Maldives, where we have set up one of the biggest coral nurseries in the world using mineral accretion technology with three, 432 table structures. 50,000 coral fragments are currently growing and will be transplanted onto the coral reef once ready. And we plan to do this year after year. In essence, funds are being re recycled to have an even bigger environmental impact and social impact. Next slide, please. Suneva is pride, proud to have been carbon neutral since 2012 for both direct and indirect emissions, such as guest flights. Sustainability lies at the very heart of our operations. Investing in climate action is not only good for the environment, but also makes business sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, 
Marnfin, for sharing your initiatives. I, I love the Waste to Wealth program and your environmental fee that funds the Seneva Fund Fund Foundation, bringing in significant funds for carbon reduction. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers for your inspirational and very practical examples of what can be done. Um, so we've now come to the Q&A. We have several questions um, that have come in from, from our uh, audience. So we'll go to um, the first one, which was about um, scope three emissions um, often being most difficult to pinpoint and reduce and any of the businesses would like to um, maybe um, Al would like to talk about how you addressed your scope three emissions yeah sure um so for us scope three emissions was largely relating to the emissions um, generated from people getting to us uh, i think anywhere between 50 to 75% of a um, of a holiday to um, Morzine is as a as a result of the, uh, the transport getting to and from the resort. Um, and where we've uh, landed on this one is we are, you know, in addition to the work that we've been doing that I talked about in my presentation around um, offsetting the carbon that we emit as part of our scope one, scope two kind of day-to-day -day operations, we are now going to be looking to ask customers to contribute towards offsetting their travel, um, a bit like um, Anfim was saying in his presentation. So we calculated that the average, um, the average emissions associated with um, getting to and from um, Morzine generally from somewhere in Europe was around nine euros per person. And we're going to be adding that to the bill um, and people can pay that, they can pay more if they've come further or they can say, look, this is not my thing and it's entirely voluntary. And we're hoping that by doing that, most people will be happy to, to contribute. And, and that, for us, that's the, um, it's a really important way of, of offsetting that huge component of the overall emissions associated with uh, with the holiday um but i'm you know interested to hear what other people's um approaches to these the scope three emissions are thanks al arnfin you have your hand up um yeah i mean we have been measuring our our um, carbon emissions uh, since uh, 2008 9 um, and we at that time uh, we didn't have an option and when we looked at other tools they were only looking at scope one and two so we developed our own tool following the greenhouse gas protocol um, and we took into consideration our indirect emissions so bringing in produce the food had been eaten um, and also transport and and, and guest uh, air travel and and for us when you look at guest air travel we don't have any option uh, that people have to travel far, and that counts for about 70% uh, of, of our total emission. And when you look at overall indirect, it's about um, uh, 80%. So with that, um, uh, we can do many things to lower our emissions. Uh, but uh, when you want to then take, take care of, of those indirect, such as guest air travel, uh, you rely on, on offset. And that's where we, we went to the route where we in, introduced um, environmental uh, fee um, that we then have invested into uh, carbon mitigating projects uh, that enable us to stay carbon neutral um, and then um, also been able to do a lot of, of uh, improvements and now we are getting to the stage where we are reinvesting into further newer projects so so that's really creating a cycle of of um, improvements and, and decarbonization. Great, thank you so much, Arnfin. Uh, we had a question to Ali about the Seagrass project and monitoring. Um, and you mentioned the Blue Carbon Lab. Is it um, monitored by marine biologists, the progress of the seagrass? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again? Uh, the question came from the audience about the seagrass um, implementation and measurement is if there is a marine biologist how 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 is the monitoring being done? If it's um, by yeah, a so, laboratory mm -hmm. or working with an institution? Yeah, so we developed 
a, so when we first started looking into seagrass, there were not much research done. It was sort of like a great area in modest marine research. So we invited some experts uh, from who has been studying seagrass in Australia uh, for like for a long time. Um, so we it was uh, James Cook University uh, and Murdoch University. So we had a professor uh, come to visit us, uh, Sixth Islam and sort of look into the seagrass and develop a method um, uh, how to how to monitor it. Um, so it's done by the Medin Balji team at Six and Islam. It's also known as called Mui. It's the, it's the Mui team. Uh, and like we've been monitoring for past uh, for five years now. So over time it has changed. Uh, the first one was done sort of like collaboratively, collaboratively with the whole team. But now we do uh, provide kind of placements in our team for students from Maldives uh, National University to come and do as a part of their um, uh, part of their part of the program that they're doing. Um, and we yeah we collected the carbon cores to look at the carbon storing capacity, uh, and we had to send it to uh, we couldn't send it to Australia because it's really hard to get things there. So. So it was sent to um, um, Hawaii, I live in Hawaii, and we have received the data. So we're just uh, looking into like, what's the, like just uh, finalizing it. Uh, and we are working with uh, Blue Carbon Lab, uh, which specializes in blue carbon um, uh, and getting a, a scheme. It's, it's a fund financing scheme um kind of thing ready uh it's in the it's in the works so uh hopefully by next year we'll we'll have something more solid great thank you so much shelly um we'll go to the question from fatima what are the to terry uh what are the aspects of the carbon neutral stay that you mentioned during your presentation yes uh, thank you well just talking about the the overall plain to, to Mauritius, uh, we need to clarify something. What we mean carbon neutral stay, it starts when you reach the hotel. Unfortunately, uh, up to now, we, we're not able to offset the carbon uh, from, from the flight. On mm -hmm. that one, we, we hope to extend the stay of guests who come, who come to Mauritius to encourage to travel less. And then we hope that with technology that, that gets better. Having said that, I think aviation contributes to 3% of the carbon problem we have, we have, but we talk a lot more about it than just 3%. But we focused on what we can control. So what we mean by the carbon neutral state is that as, as the client checks in and everything we're going to be doing in the hotel, it started really by estimating, by measuring our carbon impact. And that which are... are I stated earlier on this equivalent of 80 kilo per, per guest night. So to invest the equivalent amount of money in projects that will have the opposite effect of the photovoltaic uh, energy, for example, which instead of using normal uh, energy, it's what, it's what you save on your carbon. So it's an effort which is two pronged. The first one is reducing uh, the energy consumed and everything from your supplies, your procurement, so that it reduces your bill. But what you have not been able to reduce, it's to invest in a counter effect uh, project, if I may say, to bring it back to neutrality. I don't know if I'm clear. Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are we are just about at time here, but we'll we'll go to the uh, final question. Um, so, to any of the hotels, this is from Sanduni. Uh, could you provide more background on how you um, went about initiating nature-based solutions specifically for carbon credits? Maybe Arnfin. Um, in addition, how do you ensure the local community benefits from such projects? Well, we have two nature-based pro projects that generate uh, carbon uh, credits, uh, or, or the one will be generating carbon credits. The first one is the Myanmar Stoves campaign um, that provides energy-efficient cook stoves to uh, rural families in, in Myanmar. Uh, and what that means is that they, they normally cook with open 
fire and use a lot of wood that they have to cut down trees to do. And the cook stoves uh, allow them to halve their, their needs uh, for the firewood. So that's a great way of reducing deforestation. Um, so, um, and, and also improving, um, reducing the soth um, about 80%. So also a great health, uh, health benefit for the end users. So there you have the social component that they get better um, disposable income, because uh, they spend up to 40% of their income on, on firewood. Um, and also from a health impact is, is a fantastic one. And the other project that we have, uh, have just started this year is a mangrove planting project um, where we're restoring mangroves. And that's obviously a, a fantastic way of um, uh, restoring nature. Um, and also, um sequestrating carbon um mangroves sequestrate uh, carbon about five times more than than um uh, forest on, on land so a fantastic way of both uh, in uh, restoring nature and um producing reducing carbon credits excellent thank you Arnfin, for that okay the final question here is from daniel turner he says um Great to hear about projects to restore nature uh, and as, as for part of climate action, any, um, but about assessing and minimizing negative impacts on nature, surely that step has to be taken first. Is there anyone who would like to uh, discuss efforts to both um, understand the negative impacts of um, in their destination and, and what they are doing to address those in terms of how their programs have been designed. Um, Ali? Yeah, so we uh, run quite a lot of uh, research on our island. We look at the beach, uh, we, we monitor the beach, how it's shifting every month. We look at our coral reefs uh, every six months to see if there's any, like what's the status of it? Is it improving or if it's, if it's getting bad. Um, so yeah, long-term monitoring uh, of our like ecosystem that surrounds the environment is quite important and it can be used as an indicator how your business or your operation is affecting the, the environment that you operate on. Uh, and from there, I think uh, in different areas where you operate and depending on how you operate can vary. So understanding um, that can help plan better. So for us, uh, with everything has been like running research and using that information to develop plans and projects uh, that would create some kind of impact that is relevant and useful to the area. So working with community as well, like it's understanding what is needed um, mm -hmm. and working around that uh, and also making sure that the community do participate in the planning um and there is a multi multi stakeholder uh, committees uh, that can contribute valuable information to better plan and strategize our projects thank you so much ali thanks to all for your questions and to the speakers again for providing your excellent examples of action um, towards um, reducing impacts in your destinations and on climate action the next webinar um, on circular economy will be Friday at noon UTC. And the following webinar on food systems is next Friday. Um, and I think the links were in the chat for those um, to register. And we appreciate you taking a feedback survey, which will pop up now when you leave the webinar. Uh, it just helps us to obviously um, review and, and revise and improve every time. So thanks again to everyone for attending today and to our speakers and we'll see you at the next one.